Hi, I'm Jim O'Shaughnessy, and welcome to Infinite Loops. Sometimes we get caught up in what feel like infinite loops when trying to figure things out. Markets go up and down, research is presented and then refuted, and we find ourselves right back where we started. The goal of this podcast is to learn how we can reset our thinking on issues that hopefully leaves us with a better understanding as to why we think the way we think and how we might be able to change that to avoid going in infinite loops of thought. We hope to offer our listeners a fresh perspective on a variety of issues and look at them through a multifaceted lens, including history, philosophy, art, science, linguistics, and yes, also through quantitative analysis. And through these discussions help you not only become a better investor, but also become a more nuanced thinker. With each episode, we hope to bring you along with us as we learn together. Thanks for joining us. Now, please enjoy this episode of Infinite Loops. Jim O'Shaughnessy is Chairman and Co-Chief Investment Officer of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management, where Jamie Catherwood is an associate. All opinions expressed by Jim, Jamie, and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Clients of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Well, hello, everybody. It's Jim O'Shaughnessy with yet another edition of Infinite Loops. I'm very excited about my guest today. I'm very excited about all my guests because I'm so lucky to talk to so many smart, interesting people. My guest today is Jake Taylor, the CEO of Farnham Street and the author of a book I read before I knew you called The Rebel Allocator. Welcome, Jake. Thanks, Jim. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Although I do feel a little bit of nerves given the quality of guests that have set the bar on this already. So <laughs> I'm gonna, I'll am gonna i do my damnedest to give you a good show, but uh, I can't make any promises. <laughs> well, I like that. Under promise, over deliver. I think that's what's going to happen. Anyway, so I want to start off with the book, The Rebel Allocator, because I I personally loved it. Um, I got to tell you, I didn't, I didn't love the story aspect so much. Um, but I really love the fact that what you were doing was what very similar to what my friend Dave Chilton did with a book called The Wealthy Barber. Um, and what she did was give it like a, an MBA level class in asset allocation and, and why certain things are that you really have to know about if you want to succeed with a story. So I love the format. Um, the first question I have for you is, One of the things that you say is the iron law of economics, right, is uh, not Ceteris Paribus, not that one. (laughs) (laughs) The, the, The iron law is cost must be less than price. The price, and here's the real important part as far as I'm concerned, the price has to be less than the value the customer enjoys. Please enlighten me. Yeah, uh, that... The original framework for that uh, came from Nick Gogarty has this book called The Nature of Value that has, and it, he showed like that cri- cost and price and value have to be in relation to each other in a, in a certain way in order for it to be a sustainable system, right? So if your costs are above your price, you're unprofitable and you're going to go out of business. If your prices are above the value that, that customers are receiving, then they're going to stop patronizing your good or service and you're going to go out of business. So we have to have all these things lined up in order to have a successful, long-term, sustainable business. And what I then in the book took, uh, I tried to like make it as simple as possible and imagine the, the, in the story, there's a restaurateur who is, is kind of the Yoda of this lesson, the Mr. Miyagi, and he's teaching well, he's uh, actually this, Mr. X, right? Mr. Mr. X, Francis, yeah, but yeah, Francis Xavier, if I, my memory is. That's correct. Uh, although okay. I kind of, it's been a while since I've read it as well, so I uh-huh. you probably would remember <laughs> better than I would. Um, uh, so, it, I use these straws basically as an example to show the relative motion between cost, price, and value. And what's interesting then is that you can start to see that between cost and value. If you move price around, you can change the profitability of the company, which is 
cost are subtracted from price. And then the difference between price and value might be called brand. So you can see the trade-offs between the prices that you are charging will either create profit for you or another way of thinking about it, actually kind of stored profit in the minds of your customer for later use. Um, and that would be what brand is. So uh, I, I wanted to, I mean, the whole thing behind the book was to try to give business people a, a useful framework. So I knew I had to start at kind of a microeconomics level and build up like unit economics effectively. And that's, that's really what the, the, the cost price value uh, exercise was all about. Yeah. And, and it's, it, it's a good way to start people out because, you know, so many people these days are, you know, a lot of the classes that I'll read the notes from and everything, um, you know, they're not just doing the basics. And I think that when people lose sight of that, they, they start, um, you know, uh, pricing everything to magic as opposed to the real world. Let's continue with the trade-offs between profit and brand, though. That's something I'm really interested in. Um, and running after profits is, in many cases, a suboptimal uh, strategy. Um, and there's, a, there's another thing that uh, an investor or an owner should know. And I know you know it because you talk about it a lot, the return on invested capital. Mm -hmm. um, talk to me a little bit about um, uh, what, what, are, what are the hazards if you're chasing those profits uh, at the expense uh, of uh, building the brand? Yeah, exactly right. So if you imagine the, especially if price is getting over the value of what you're receiving, right? And that's, you know, I think we've all been, uh, felt subjected to that, right? Like we felt cheated by that business and now we're kind of mad about it and that's destroying a brand. So, you know, I mean, maybe it's not as true today, but you know, in years past, everyone hated cable companies because oh, I hate, you know, these bastards are overcharging me and under delivering and making me buy a bundle and I don't want a bundle. Um, well, eventually it may take time, but consumers will find a way to get around you so eventually. It may take a long time, but uh, to go back to return on invested capital, that, that's really important when it comes to growth. So when you think about a business that's growing, you can grow and grow and grow, but if you are giving away a dollar for 80 cents over and over again, growth is not a good thing then. Uh, even if <laughs> you, know, you are, are VC subsidized, uh, you know, it's, but I should caveat this, that there are some, there's some nuance to it in that it's possible when you reach a certain scale, especially for a network business, where you all of a sudden become wildly profitable, but you had to invest a long way to get the, the network scaled up to a certain size and inertia. Right. So yeah. uh, it's not quite as simple as like, oh, low return on invested capital equals bad business. Um, but over a long enough period of time, we can start to say that. And if you have a low return on invested capital of your projects as a business person, Growing may not be the right thing for you to do. In fact, maybe shrinking and retrenching and getting your returns on capital back up and then growing from that base is probably the right strategy. So return on invested capital is, I, I likened it to actually like weightlifting in that you, the return on invested capital is the form that you're using to, to lift the weights. And you want to make sure you're having good form. Now, if, you're, if you have bad form and you load a bunch of growth, you load a bunch of weights on there, it's going to crush it and, and destroy it, right? But so you have to make sure that you're keeping good form the whole time as you're growing. Yeah, AOL with the uh, plethora of, uh, of the CD. Uh, you're probably too young to remember those. Oh, no, I remember that. Oh my God. We, we used them, we let our kids play Frisbee with them because we got like five in the mail every day. Okay. Um, so I hear you there. What, what about, so we're always trying to evolve our strategies. We're quants, as you know. Mm -hmm. And um, what we find is some th sometimes things like stop working and they're probably not going to continue to work. And, and one of our great examples was price to book, sure. uh, which, which used to work really, really well until you went back and got the new data set from, from CRISP for 1928 through 1964, and you found that it was inverted because another thing low price to book is a proxy for is bankruptcy risk. And, but there's another problem with it, and that is this idea that we're talking about right now, which is 
brand intangibles. Right. So, so we have moved into a heavy intangible economy. And so we wanted to find quantitative measurements that could capture that intangible value. And so I think we did a pretty good job, but I'd like to hear how you do that. And then like the instant thing that pops to mind is, okay, so Apple is probably one of the most powerful brands out there right now. Um, they charge premium prices, not, not uh, lower prices. What, what do you think? How do you, how do you look at intangibles? Yeah, I mean, you're right. It has become, I think it was maybe in the late 90s, it switched over to where CapEx, physical, you know, tangible investments crossed, went under now what intangible investment became. Um, and, and mostly in like R&D and a lot of coding actually in the last, you know, call it 20 years. Um, yeah. And it gets, it's, it, it's pretty obvious to me now that accounting has decayed somewhat from economic reality. And there's some good reasons for that. I mean, if you're trying to be as conservative as possible, which is one of the, the tenets of accounting, uh, it's very hard to assign a very specific value to code. Um, it, and there's some things that happen like, uh, you know, technical obsolescence can like happen like that. And so if you are trying to break up the useful life of code and decide, okay, I want to expense it against a certain usage time period, like one year at a time. Well, all of a sudden, like two years later, it's, it's not worth anything uh, because you're, you were Blackberry and the iPhone came along, uh, you fall off a cliff. Well, like accounting shouldn't set you up for those kind of mistakes, right? It's trying to be conservative. So there's a reason why, but, but it's clearly has, has devolved from economic reality uh, and slipped a little bit as compared to when we just had factories and, you know, property plant and equipment. And that was like, you could go out in the yard and see exactly what you had uh, on your balance sheet. You know, one of my soapboxes of many, I know <laughs> I, you can't get me to shut up. Uh, but is this idea that GDP is irrelevant. It is absolutely irrelevant because it is still calculated the old way and it is not capturing, oh, probably these days, 70% of what's actually happening. And like when I started on this soapbox, I always used Intel as my example because they have all of these level five uh, plants, manufacturing plants um, in developing countries and they compete only on price. So Intel does all the um, symbol manipulation, if you will. I call myself a symbol manipulator. You're a symbol manipulator. And that's where the value is, right? So, so the brilliant people at Intel come up with a design for a new chip. They ship it over to the winning bidder, which is a level five. So like almost no flaws ever, or that company will go out of business. That's how serious it is. Yeah. They pay them like 9% these days as a profit margin, and that's getting competitive. And then they ship the product back to the United States, and Intel enjoys a 40% margin. I'm making these numbers up. Uh, but but that's happening more, more and more. But yeah. Right, right now. Yeah. So when I started it, it was higher. Yeah. But, um, but so I think that that's going to persist and that we're going to need new tools to be able to like make the smart choices about, about um, what is a good investment, what might've been a good investment a while back and no longer is. Um, but one, one I, framework, Jim, that I, I like that, uh, that helps me to untangle some of these kinds of things and to go back to your Apple example of like, how do they charge such premium prices? And yet the customer keeps coming back. Like, isn't this a competitive market? And uh, there's, it's this jobs to be done framework that, that Clayton Christensen had mentioned in one of his books and other people have done more work on it and taken it further. But really at the end of the day, we all have subjective wants and needs as humans. We want you know, food and shelter. We can work our way up Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And then, then we start to, once you kind of jump off the top of that pyramid, you go into memetics and, uh, you know, Rene Girard's work where now it's like, why do we want what we want? And at the end of the day, every single good or service that we are consuming that we decide to buy is to give us some sense of progress against one of our wants or needs. We hire that company to do a job for us. And whatever that job is, is what should dictate 
the value to us, right? That part of our value straw. And then there's the price. And the price doesn't necessarily have to do anything with the cost. It's a value that's derived. So take the Apple iPhone, for instance, and you know, it replaced a hundred different gadgets that we used to have in the you know, 1980s, uh, whether it was your radio and flashlight and compass and telephone and uh, GPS and like a million things, right? And now it's in one easy package and it always works. Uh, and it's, it provides, it, it's high, we hire that to do a thousand jobs for us a day, practically. Okay. And, and it's why one of the things it would be the first thing that you would cry if they took it away from you, right? I mean, like you almost can't live without it now. People can't imagine. Um, so <laughs> that has nothing to do with how much a transistor costs. It has nothing to do with the screw that went into, you know, in when they made it in China and shipped it over. There's nothing to do with the costs. So it, the man, like that world of kind of cost plus in an industrial sense, like, oh, well, it took us, we, you know, we're going to make sure we get 15% profit margins because it took us, you know, a dollar to make that widget. Well, that's, that's the old world. And now if you think about the world in the jobs to be done framework, and because you can hire for kind of increasingly interesting specialities, it's even further di divorced from value, price, and then cost. Yeah. And, uh, you know, now we're in Rory Sutherland land, uh, yes. who's a good friend of mine. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think he's right. Uh, it is the consumer or the purchaser who determines the value of these products. Uh, there's a great book that I just finished reading um, by a guy by the name of Howard Bloom. And uh, we'll put the title, it's uh, Retaming the Beast or whatever. And it's a pro, very, very pro free markets book. But it's also a critique. And one of the things that he makes, one of the points he makes endlessly is that there is no demand. There is desire. Mm. And, and, and he goes on to say that, like it or not, human beings play status games. And they play signaling games. And virtually all of the most useful products started out as frivolities. The example he gives is the printing press of all things. Um, and he, he tells the story about Gutenberg, whose day job before he came up with the printing press was gem polisher. And who, poli who you know, who is he selling to? Well, he's selling to the richest people in society. And he was trying to come up with a way to do his pamphlets quicker. And we got the movable press and all of the first books were status items. The mm. first books that got sold were jewel encrusted and they were only sold to the nobility. Yeah. Uh, but then he was kind of like, wait a tick. <laughs> there, there might be some people. There's this Martin Luther fellow who is saying that uh, people should read the Bible, but it's only in Latin or Greek. I wonder what would happen if we published it in German and the rest is history. So I think that that is a, a, a great framework in which to uh, build, build, to build the scaffolding, if you will, for a new way of looking at markets and investing. I'm glad you brought up the status items because one of the, the takeaways of jobs to be done is that you do hire a service or a product to signal a status thing. So like, especially early iPhone, like you bought it, half of the reason was to show off to your friends. Uh, yep. you, you, owe, you will pay a lot for that item because you're getting that job to be done hired of showing off. Uh, and let's say like, uh, you know, we start to then tip in towards like identity things, like where we wanna be internally consistent and you know, you wear a Patagonia shirt because you you know, believe in what that company believes in and you'll pay $200 for a sweater that would, if you would, if it didn't have that little logo on it, then you would have paid $20 for it, but you're not hiring the, that sweater to keep you warm. That's one of the jobs, but there's another job you're hiring it for. And that is to signal a certain thing about yourself to everyone else. Yeah. I have a, I have a young guy who I've had on the podcast, Rob Henderson, who's getting his PhD at Cambridge. Um, and this is his, this is what he is looking at. And he came up with a really interesting thesis around what he calls luxury beliefs. Um, you know, spoiler alert, they're not all that great. And um, 
So, so, but he, he, he does a very good job for a 30 year old guy of uh, explaining, you know, wh- why they're so powerful and like offline, one of the conversations that I had with him and others was um, this, I read a piece, I can't remember with the New York times or the wall street journal, but it's uh, people under a certain age um, won't respond to texts that come with the different color, meaning that oh, you're using an ant, you're not using an iPhone. Yeah, and I found that extraordinary. <laughs> I mean, weird, Is that the right? New Protestants and Catholics. <laughs> I guess I don't know. It's just like to me is so bizarre. Um, but I think that you know, as again, as quantitative investors, we got to find a way to model that because. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's becoming increasingly clear, um, and we're going to talk about um, uh, a, a, a really interesting innovation that you and your firm have come up with in a second here. Um, but um, so all of our brain power, so to speak, is going on the on the research side, is going towards these new metrics that we feel are are efficacious in trying to you know. Uh, grasp these things that are harder and harder to grasp. Uh, I was talking to a friend last night and, you know, uh, they've got this show, actually not a friend, my daughter-in-law and um, she's my friend too. Yeah. Uh, but um, I was babysitting for my grandkids and, and we got to talking about uh, the Gilded Age, which is on mm-hmm. HBO. Yeah. And, and I asked her, do you know why that when Forbes came out with the rich list, do you know why it was the Forbes 400? And she was like, no. And I went, because Mrs. Astor's bell room, uh, ballroom only ha- held 400 people. <laughs> interesting. And she was like, wow, that's weird. But then the other interesting part of it is when you look at the first one they came up with, everyone on the list who had made their own money, which we were in the minority, by the way, yeah, uh, the majority had inherited their wealth. And this was in, I don't know, 82 or 81, whatever it came out. Um, so I was 21 or 22. Um, but the people who made their own money, it was in physical things, right? It was in real estate, oil, shipping, all of these things. With flash forward to today, virtually just a handful of people who've inherited uh, the money. Everyone else, as I said to you before we started recording, symbol manipulators, right? People like Bill Gates, people like Elon Musk, people like uh, Bezos, et cetera. So, you know, the ability to, to capture that, I think very, very important. But the reason I, I'm at length telling this story is because it also shows that we are often trapped by these invisible beliefs that we don't even know we have. Like, so Forbes 400, who's Mrs. Astor? What the hell? <laughs> well, you know, this is bizarre, Yeah. right? And, and so I always try to uncover those things when like I'm trying to get a new thesis to test or whatever, a lot of what we believe is because of things that happened a long time ago, no longer relevant, but here we are, right? Um, And so that kind of leads me into the thing that you've let, uh, to to my great pleasure, allowed me to take a look at, which is your firm's new um, idea called Journalytic. Tell me what you can... Uh, tell me about publicly about that. <laughs> yeah, I should probably preface that we're still very, very early days, uh, you know, in a in a beta mode. So it's it's um, still a little stealth, but um, I'm I'm crazy excited about where we're going and and the team that we're building to to build the, uh, the software. And it really it it started with uh, you know being an investor and more discretionary. Like everybody read the checklist manifesto and. Uh, you know, like, oh yeah, checklist, that's a good idea. Like, I know I can only store so many things in my head at one time. I need to get that out of my head somewhere else so that I have some framework. And I built up a pretty extensive checklist. And I read this research paper that said, if you even just randomize the order of presentation of something like a checklist, that you will engage more system two thinking. So, so slowing down, more executive, less gut reaction, right? That's your system one. Well, <laughs> I, it's like, well, okay, I need software to randomize this, like, because I just have it as a in a document that I'm going through, and I could tell, like, I know where I'm cutting corners. Like, I'll like, you know, I'll shortchange one of the questions because I just want to get to the next question. Like, we are right. 
we're just trying to like keep our caloric expenditures in our brain to a minimum. Well, so yeah, you get, um, you recognize like, oh my God, there's a, my entire process could stand to be put into a software kind of approach to just improve the processing of information. And the, the one of the biggest things that, that I think we recognize was that there's there are kind learning environments and there are wicked learning environments, according to researcher Robin Hogarth. A kind learning environment is one where feedback is immediate, it's clear, it's unambiguous, and it's re like they're repeatable patterns. So you're, you're riding along on a bike and you, you know, turn the handlebar real hard and you crash, and that's going to happen every single time you do it. And you're going to quickly learn that that's not a good idea to jerk the handlebar. Now, in, in the investing context, it is an incredibly wicked environment. And a lot of that has to do with it, this is a complex adaptive system that you're dealing with, with, with positive feedback loops that lead to runaway outcomes that are very hard to predict. You have nonlinearities all over the place. You have initial starting conditions of a, of a complex system that will then lead to wildly different outcomes and outputs of a complex system. And now you're trying to like wrap your mind around and make predictions about what's going to happen in the world. It's so incredibly hard. And, and to challenge it, we would use uh, Michael Mobison's idea that he, when he, in luck versus skill research about how could you, if I said, Jim, I want you to try to pick one stock for me where I want you, your goal is to lose the most you can over the next year. It's almost impossible. I know. <laughs> now, I bet you could probably do something smart if I said, pick a security to lose the most over the next 10 years. I think you'd actually have an okay shot at that. But yep. the noise of any one year is so incredibly hard to overcome when you're trying to tie your decision with the, the eventual outcome. And so one of the ways around that is to start journaling about what you're thinking, what you're feeling, record your decisions, record your predictions, and actually like assign some probabilities to them so that you can see, uh, get a sense of your confidence versus your competence. Um, all of these things are just like very basic best practices, but that by decision-making researchers like Daniel Kahneman, like he'll tell you, just go get a notebook and write down your decisions. Like, and you'll become an incredibly better decision maker, but no one does it. Right. I do. I, I do. <laughs> well, that's why you're so damn successful, Jim. I mean, that's the, that's the difference. Um, so as you, with journalytic and the, the name, by the way, comes from journaling on the front end, which we, we think journaling is like one of the best ways to interface with your brain and, and get all this stuff out of it and make room for the good ideas to, to proliferate. Tied in then, because we know people are going to be using it in an investment context, we can have structure in like that is readily build, buildable within your journal so that we can tie in reports and analytics on the back end to give you that feedback loop and close it so that you become a, a quicker learner as to like the cause and effect between your decisions. So instead of having to wait maybe 10 or 15 years to figure out, God, do I have any luck versus skill in an investing game? We're hoping to shorten that timeline so that you can get a much better sense of where you are and how you're improving. And uh, I I'm incredibly excited to be able to help people in that way. And using a, it myself now, kind of a, a very rudimentary version for more than a year now, like it's it's been a game changer for me. And like, I, I'm much, much better investor than I was even two years ago because of the, it's, a, it's just like a diligent practice. And it like, it forces you to get in there and like do the real work every day. And um, it's, uh, I'm, I think it's going to be really interesting and um, I'm excited to see where it goes. Yeah, very exciting. I, you were gracious enough to let me see uh, a the beta version. I think it's very, very cool. But obviously, we're we, you're playing to my biases here. Totally, because <laughs> preaching to the choir. I, you really are. I mean, we're in the same pew <laughs> because. <laughs> You know, uh, journaling is something I've tried to get people to do forever for lots of reasons, not not just the ones you mentioned, although one, the ones you mentioned are very important, because if you can't write down what you think, you don't know what you think. Yes. And if you write it out, sometimes you uh, have the puzzler. Oh, I thought I thought that, but I don't think that at all. I and, can't believe and, I thought that before. That makes no sense. 
which is which is the our memories are unreliable narrators. Um, you know, Mother Nature and evolution think that it's doing us a kindness <laughs> by updating our memories to what we believe now. Let me ask you a question though about journalistic. Um, are are you going to have to? So it seems to me that you have like two mountains to climb. The first mountain to climb is to get people to actually keep a journal. Yes. So I want to hear your strategy around that. And then secondly, um, they're, they're the naysayers who are going to say, well, I can just uh, I can just uh, find, you know, the the software uh, to, to do this. You know, spoiler alert, everyone listening. No, you can't. You won't. But <laughs> you're, you're going to think that you can. Tell me how you're going to address those two. Yeah. Uh, so with the journaling first, you're right. Like it, this is, it's a very comparable uh, analogy to like getting someone to go to the gym. Yeah. Everyone knows it's good for them. Uh, how do you get that activation energy high enough to go? And then, and you, as you know, like once you get the habit going, you actually start to look forward to it, but it's that initial on-ramp. And so that's where I, we are looking at ways to, to create some fun gamification around it. And hopefully mm. gamification in the way that is good for you. Like, I don't want to be gamification with like confetti because uh, you've right. placed a, you know, an options trade uh, type of. <laughs> of right. <laughs> we are, we're some guy to go there. Yeah. Um, I want it to be like for your, for your benefit. But I think that there are some creative ways to, to lower that activation energy, help you get over the bar to get the habit going, start small, uh, you know, build from there and, and use the research of, you know, stuff like from atomic habits where you have, you can tie in triggers that will, you know, okay. Like I know every time I do this, I'm going to take this action. Um, yeah. So it, it, you're right though. I mean, it's, it's no layup that that's going to be like, ever, I'm, everyone's all of a sudden going to be a journaler. Um, and it, 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 I think there's a little bit like it requires some growth mindset um, that, is like, I think I can get better at this. So therefore, like, I'm going to put in the work to get better. Yeah. Uh, I, the other I, thing I, too, I, is I would go. hope that starting in a financial context in that improving your investing, that the monetary potential gain would maybe provide some of that activation energy to get you working on it. Once you recognize the problem and you see the potential, you see the job to be done that you would be hiring it for and where it might take you, Another part of the jobs to be done framework is it actually gets into like Joseph Campbell's hero's journey where you're, you're taking the customer and making them the hero of the journey. And that's your job as the, the proprietor. Uh, and so how do we, like, how do we make you the hero and get you started and show you, boy, like a year from now, look at these reports you're going to be able to see about yourself. If you put in this little bit of effort right now and get that habit going. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, one of the reasons why I, I didn't know this before we had lunch at Capital Camp, but it's, I certainly knew it afterwards. Like we're into this exact same things like the, the Joseph Campbell uh, uh, hero's journey. Uh, my friend Tom Morgan talks about that all the time. I've studied it extensively because it's in our it seems to be in our DNA. It seems to be in our human OS. And if you can get some hooks into that you're probably going to be more successful than if not. I mean, one idea that I would have is like, maybe you preload some great stories. Maybe you, maybe you give it to people from various sectors of society, from a newbie investor all the way up to a pro. And, and you, you let their stories unfold. Like if you were marketing that, that would be one of the things that I would think of is because again, I, like I used to joke, I'm a quant who had to tell stories about why you shouldn't invest using stories. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's in our DNA and, and you can either go with the flow or you can try to swim against the tide. And I got to tell you, um, you know, at least in my career n equals one, but um, trying to, trying to go against the flow does not lead to great things. Yeah. It's a lot easier to, uh, to get the horse to go the direction you want if he's already going that way, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, uh, if, if we can build tech tools that allow us to leverage um, our thinking, leverage our own brains, our own style, yes. um, those are going to be incredibly valuable tools, in, in my opinion. 
I couldn't agree more. And I, one of the early ahas and inspirations was, and I think we've talked about this before, uh, you and I offline, but uh, about Carl Friston and this idea of the the free energy principle. And it's it's fiendishly difficult to explain the whole thing. I mean, this guy is a, a true genius. Um, but if if you want to go down a rabbit hole, I would encourage someone to check it out. But the the takeaway is that all living things from the multi, little tiny, you know, single cellular organism to us with our big, you know, neocortexes are seeking to create models of the world and then compare the sensory input to that model and then minimize the amount of difference between that, which Friston calls free energy, which we might call surprise. So yes. you want to admit you're just your, your brain is always trying to figure out what's the next thing that's going to happen. How does that compare to the sensory input that's coming in? And how do I minimize the difference between that? How do I get less surprises? Now, what, why technology can help us with that is that when we were just on the savanna and the world was very linear for us and we just saw you know, the gazelle moving along the horizon and he never was going at one speed and then going 10x faster and 100x faster, we have no real sense of intuition around non-linearity and that's what makes it really hard for us as a species to only just use our our wet work here we need help we need tools we need things that can take the good things about our brains which are incredible organisms like think about it for a second this three pound ish lump of mass of cells is the only thing that we know really in the entire universe that knows that there's even a universe right I know. It's amazing. It's amazing. But we know that there's some problems with it because the today's environment doesn't match our evolutionary environment. So, and that's what tools and technology have always been about is to like get us the tools and the the ability to do more with less. And I think you're right. Like today's digital tools are going to be able to help our brains in such a way that we can tighten up that feedback loop, that that surprise minimization of my decision today to buy something and whether that was a good outcome or not in an investment context is so long and so hard to keep track of if you're only doing it in your head that you need a tool to shorten that up and close that feedback loop for you so that your brain can keep working on that surprise minimization for you. I mean, you need a tool. It's just, there's like no two ways about it. Yeah. And like, uh, again, we could not be any more simpatico. We're doing a series for infinite loops called the great reshuffle, which touches on all of these uh, ideas. Um, I think that we are in the middle of one of the greatest reshuffles uh, in human history. And I'm delighted that I'm here to witness this. <laughs> to watch it happen. Um, yeah. You know, and, and one of them uh, is we have moved from linear uh, behavior to nonlinear behavior, that's a really tough one for your average human being to get because as you say, evolution has not made us uh, so to understand that well. And, and, and we have moved into a period where comfort with chaos is almost gonna be a requirement. Um, and I had another guest on who I've also, you know, disclosure invested in his company. Uh, but where he's talking about, you know, variance amplification and variance uh, dampening institutions. And, and he's like, you know, whatever you want to say, the internet is the largest variance amplifier that human history has ever seen. Yeah. And, and so it's if like we the don't, ultimate Archimedial lever, it really is. And if we don't have these, uh, if A, we don't understand it, so we're doing the series to try to help people understand what's going on and give them kind of ideas about, okay, this is what you might want to learn about because all that old stuff that, you know, you can have to delete it. I'm convinced that one of the greatest things that I'm able to do, thank God, is delete beliefs yeah. because, because they're not serving me. And, and you've got it. It's and your journey, your journalytic, I think is going to be a great way to help that, that happen. But it, you know, it's also going to be a scary world and, and the, the tales are going to become far longer. And, and um, if you're in the right tail, man, the world is your oyster. Uh, but if you're in the wrong tail, 
That's why, you know, I am very much uh, in support of, say, uh, universal basic income or the citizen's dividend. These are not new ideas, yeah. you know, and by the way, they've been promoted by both the right and the left. So it seems to me, and then I'll have empiricists come up to me and say, well, Jim, it's never worked here. Look at all these. And I'm like, okay, but we, we really need to try again because if we don't have some kind of net for the people yeah. who are not going to do well in this world, that's going to be problematic. And, and I mean, your, so your guillotine risk goes through the roof. It really does. And I love that boy of phrasing it because it's true um and you can you can only push people so far until they get the pitchforks and um i think that the elites of today this is a different subject i think we'll maybe stay off of it they just don't really <laughs> they really don't have a clue um and and business seems to me to be stepping in more and more and more to offer solutions to to these challenges. I think it's going to be an amazing time, but you need a, you need a little bit of a manual to navigate that new space. And so that's what we hope to do. Le leaving that for, for the moment, uh, another thing, I mean, as I was going through your stuff and putting together my questions, I'm like, God, I agree with this guy on everything. Um, like, well, so it's good group think for us. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. So, so my immediate question is what am I wrong about here? And he's wrong about it too. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the question I want answered. What do we have wrong? <laughs> what was it, uh, Darwin? Who like if within thirty minutes he didn't if he found disconfirming evidence of something that he believed, he'd write it down right away because otherwise he knew his brain would figure out a, a reason to throw it away and never think about it again and not not destroy his identity, not destroy his story, not destroy his cherished beliefs. Absolutely true. And I cannot get people to believe that. And it is so hard to get people to understand that your brain, like I wrote a thing for uh, a thread on Twitter that actually turned out to be really popular called the thinker and the prover. Mm -hmm. And like, it basically says, Hey, you can think about it, anything you want to think about, you know, the world can be a brilliant, wonderful place or a dark, horrifying place. Yeah. But once you decide on something, your thinker gets turned off, your prover gets to work. And what does your prover do? Just what you were talking about uh, a moment ago on free energy. Your prover only is going to prove what you believe. Yeah. And so it's going to ignore all the contrary evidence and thus Darwin, right? He, he, the prover was at work and it was doing its job. That's what people need to understand. Yeah. And so what you need to understand is feed your prover some other stuff. It'll prove it. And, and one of the things about uh, really capturing the, um, the erroneous belief or the data that shows that you're wrong, I cannot tell you how much that has saved me in my life. Like I do the same thing whenever I'm wrong. And again, thank you, Apple. Um, I have this, this supercomputer that I can immediately capture. Hey, fuckhead, you're wrong about this. And I kind of make it another job to be done by your phone. <laughs> exactly. And, and I kind of make it a game, right? Because, um, uh, I, and a habit, obviously you've got to, you've got to make all of these things habitual. Um, and, and you've got to make it fun because no, I mean, come on, who wants life to be a drag? Yeah. Um, and so. You're absolutely right. And trying to convince anyone of that is like almost impossible. And yeah, I was going to ask you, speaking of Twitter, Jim, the uh, one of my favorite threads that you had is your when you were a magician and seeing uh, the old pictures. And it, it actually got me thinking about, you know, we were talking about free energy uh, principle and surprise minimization. And actually, you can kind of tie some of this stuff in with um and I know you like Eastern philosophy as well. So like Sun Tzu and this idea of Chang versus Qi. And so it's C-H-E-N-G and C-H apostrophe I. And the Chang is the, the maneuvers in a, a battle that you are showing your opponent so that they are really like they're building the mental models. You're giving them the ammo actually to think they know exactly what your next move is. And they are they think they have you all figured out and you're matching every pattern for them. You're turning on all these, 
these things in their brain that say, I know what's next, right? Because our brains are always making those predictions. Yep. And meanwhile, they don't see the chi, which is the, the rear flanking maneuver, the surprise that happens and you catch them off guard. I think that same thing maybe applies to a magician where it is Chang and Chi. It's, it's, you are building mental models in people's heads and then surprising them with, you know, with free energy, basically in a way where they, they didn't see it coming. What a great analogy and one that I hadn't thought of. So thank you. I'm going to steal that from you because as you know, great artists steal. It's all yours. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> mediocre artists copy, great artists steal. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but boy, is that true. And I learned so much. That's what led to my interest in human behavior. Like, why the hell are, why the hell are we making all these mistakes all the time? Yeah. And then my interest reliably, in, yeah, reliably, right? Like I can't predict what the market's going to do, but I can pretty well predict what human beings are going to do. Um, but that's a great way of thinking about it. And I've, I've read a lot about that as you might expect. Um, but I, I love tying it into the magic because that is, that's what magic is. Magic is building a mental model, uh, getting people to think that this is the way and, they're, and basically controlling their predictions. Yep. Right. And then, and then whoops, nope, this is what happens over here. So what it really is, is another even simpler way is you say, look over there and they do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would be curious to ask Rory Sutherland whether if he would agree with the statement that that advertising is actually just the selective turning on or off of of mental models for people in other people's brains. Yeah. So I'm going to have him on again. You know, I love Rory and and he and I get along really well. Um, And I've learned so much from him. Um, And my I, I. I don't know that I know him well enough, but my guess is he's going to love that. He's going to love that. (laughs) He's going to say that that it it really works. And then he's going to, then he's going to riff on it. And And have a hundred great stories about why. Unbelievable. Right. Like (laughs) it's just, he's so good. And you mentioned Michael Mobison. We're friends with Michael and Michelle, his wife. And like, it's just so much fun to go out and chat with because like, we have the same interests, yes, but he comes at it from a completely different uh, area, and I have just so much. I've learned so much from Michael. Um, I mean, honestly, uh, just to like circle back a little bit to journalistic, like Michael Mobison's fingerprints are all over journalistic, whether he knows it or not. I mean, it's like yeah. it's we're trying to get all of the best practices that he's been writing about for thirty years baked into this architecture to help you become better and not like make the the mistakes that everyone's kind of already identified. Yeah. Yeah. I think, well, uh, you know, we'll, we'll probably talk more about this on another podcast, but I, I, I think it looks great. And I think that um, you're probably going to do really well with it. I, I want to switch gears to another thing that I try to get people to understand and it's very difficult for me to do so. And that is you should push decision-making all the way down mm. as far as possible. And in, in, the, in your book, you wrote to those closest to the consumer. But in asset management, uh, what we do, it's push it to those closest to the activity that's being done. Yes. So like, I still remember after forming OSAM, we moved from Bear Stearns Asset Management where we had a centralized trading desk and we had trained them how to trade quant portfolios and, and we're doing it all again. And one of my guys was like, well, no, we should decide on which systems we're going to use. And I looked at him and I went, have you learned nothing from me? We should, we have no business deciding on what systems we're going to use. When was the last time you did a trade? Yeah. Uh, uh, 96, when, maybe. When was, when was Reagan president? <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> And, and so this is just another one of those great examples that I, is a really great reason to, um, to read your book, Pushing It Down. But here's a little catch that I wanted to ask you about. I also have a theory that as companies or organizations, doesn't have to be a company, uh, organizations, whatnot, grow, one of the things that happens is that the information to the top of that hierarchy gets worse and worse and worse yes. to the point where they're actually not getting valuable or true information at all. 
And I, I use McNamara during the Vietnam War as my example. Um, and again, it's, it's another great example is uh, Asian pilots. Um, the, the people who ran Korea's airline realized that they had to tr train their pilots. Westerners had to train them because in their culture, being um, uh, contrary or rude yeah. to your superior was simply not, not, simply not done. Yeah. And, and this is really weird, but people, crashes were happening because the, the uh, co-pilot who was subservient to the pilot would not tell him, hey, we're about to die. And, and so I'm not making light of this at all. I mean, it, yeah. I use that example to show people are willing to die rather than break the, the social bond of you know, the, how they interact within the hierarchy. How do you get, do you have a solution for, for how, like could McNamara have used something else? I have kind of an idea, but I'd like to hear your idea. Are you saving all the easy ones for me, Jim? Or yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I thought layups, you know, yeah, it's layups. a Friday. <laughs> yeah. I can't, I can't be too tough on Jake. So yeah. I'm just going to give him the layup question. I mean, I, I, I don't know if I have a good solution, but in general, how I think about it is that every decision should be tried to be made with the, as close to the source capital T truth that exists in reality. And, you know, at the end of the day, we're probably all kind of like Plato's cave, right? Where the allegory is that we're all chained up in a cave and we're staring at this wall and there's a fire behind us. And there are, there are objects walking past the fire and they cast this shadow up onto the wall. And we look at these shadows and we, we, we name the shadows and we call them things. But at, at the end of the day, they're not even really the real things. They're just sort of our interpretations of them. And that's like everything gets filtered in through ourselves, right? And, and I think the same thing is true for an organization. Like it, at a macro level, an organization exists and it has the same problem of trying to find capital T truths and connect it with the decision. So the more that you can push it down in a business context, the whole point of a business is to delight the customer. And the closer that the person is to the actual customer and can see what is working, the empathy, the, like, the action that we took, the expenses that we incurred, how did that delight the customer? And if you know me at headquarters as the CEO, a thousand miles away from the transaction that's happening it, you know, in, in a retail context, let's say, to make it easier to understand, I have no idea whether the customer is enjoying that product or not, but the person selling it to them has a much better idea. And so the, the more that we can tie that feedback loop closer to the person and making real decisions on the front lines, the, the better chance we have of not creating a structure of production that is mismatched with what the customer really wants. Um, another analogy might be uh, in a war context with uh, and granted, like, of course, the, the aims that they were going for were horrific and disgusting and like no one's saying this is, you know, pro Nazis or anything, but like the blitzkrieg strategy that later is, is kind of uh, really well explained by like John Boyd and Ooda loops, if you want to go down the rabbit hole. But the idea that the um, you can sort of give your frontline people, your troops an aim like we, this is what we're aiming towards and here's why. And then you, the, the what, the execution, the in-game tactics that happen are better done at the front lines and not back at headquarters. And so it's, you don't, your, your information is likely to have either been too old, right? Because that was the whole point of OODA loops is you want to have a fast input to decision, like interpretation, decision, action. And you just want yep. it to be operating faster than anyone else's. So you can't have a fast OODA loop when the information has to travel and decay a thousand miles back to you at headquarters. And then you send something out to them like, okay, well, here's the next thing you should do. Like they already know what the general goal is and they're just going to go do it for you. Um, and I think that, you know, the, all the good cultures in, in anything really, they empower people, right? They're not they're not top-down hierarchical. Like, in, in fact, like, you know, I think there's some Chinese proverb that's like, uh, truly great leaders, when, the, when the, the mission is accomplished, 
that everyone looks around and wonders like what that guy wasn't even doing anything the whole time, the leader, right? Like they did it themselves. Uh, yep. and so designing the system that allows people to go on their own hero's journey, whether it's the customer or the, the employee, um, and being the hero of the story, uh, and getting the hell out of their way, I think is like actually like a huge advantage if you can figure out how to do it creatively. Totally. Uh, that quote, by the way, is from Lao Tzu, the Tao Te Ching. And he says, the greatest of leaders uh, leaves his people thinking we've done it by ourselves. There you go. Um, and, you know, I, and another wonderful Bo Mo from him is uh, govern a large organization. He actually says country, but uh, we're trying to make it friendly for our audience. <laughs> govern a large organization the way you would cook a small fish lightly. And, and, then, and then finally, uh, complex adaptive systems we talked about earlier, like I've done a massively deep dive on those. And, and the irony and funny, funny thing that I find at least is that we have all of these top-down control systems. And if you understand a complex adaptive system, you know that all emergence comes from the bottom. The Not interplay the between <laughs> the constituent parts. Yes. And yeah. so, and so like, uh, gee, wonder why the Soviet Union failed. Well, guess what? They had a model that didn't work and they refused to admit that it didn't work. Right. And, and, you know, That's right. It, so it, prices it, convey information in a, in an economy. And so that's how supply and demand finds its level. And it's so amazing to think that I have this little list in my head of a calculus of the things that I want that are most important to me. And businesses try to figure out how to match that list. And they figure out what they have to do to make me happy. And the idea that uh, we all have that calculus happening, and there's you know billions of these ideas and transactions happening at all times that are, are creating a price. And I mean, this is what Hayek was talking about with the fatal conceit, which was the yes. idea that you could know what the right price of anything was when it's based on billions of interactions of ever changing and ever shifting preferences and ever shifting production capabilities to be able to do that math would be an absolute just insanity of ego to think that you were capable of that. <laughs> uh, we'll have to have you back on, but um, you know, one of the, one of the things that you say, uh, both in your book and in, in other uh, endeavors is like, if, if you're really going to be looking for, um, you know, the, the, the best people to be making decisions, you cite three qualities that that person needs to have. If you wouldn't mind, go through them for our audience. Well, I mean, I'm just, uh, I'm stealing uh, like a great artist uh, from, from Buffett, which is, it's, energy, integrity, uh, and then uh, like basically like aptitude, um, like smarter, the better. And he, Buffett makes the joke that if, 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 they're, uh, if, they, if you have low integrity, then you actually want them to be dumb and lazy. Uh, right. so, <laughs> exactly. So, but, but all three of those things are, are hugely important. Like there's, it's the capability that the person has. It's the, the energy and because, you know, we're, we all will absorb the energy of the people around us. And you know it when you're around someone who has a lot of energy and like, God, you just come away from it feeling like better than you felt before. Uh, and then obviously integrity, like that's so important, like trust, especially nowadays in, in complex systems, trust is actually one of the like key ingredients of any of those systems. Uh, and I think that's actually why Berkshire has been so successful and been able to run such a decentralized operation is because they have an incredible level of trust amongst, they're able to, to delegate to the point of abdication because they have such trust. Um, and and there, a ton of decision-making, like I actually did a little math on this at one point when I was thinking about cap allocation within Berkshire. And so for every single dollar coming in the door, like I'm looking at cash flow from operations, what, who made the decision on where that money went? So I looked at like, okay, well, there's CapEx, there's, um, you know, inventory, there's a bunch of different places that money can go. There's buybacks, when you look at M&A, and when you look at it, Buffett is actually only making about 30% of the decisions within Berkshire. The other 70% is pushed down the organization to the front lines, to the people closer to trying to satisfy the customer, to 
the shorter feedback loop, all the stuff that we've been talking about. And he's just at the very, very top level of, you know, M&A and buybacks and dividends and, uh, you know, a, a little bit of like some cap allocation to if the business needs more money for another project. But for the most part, they're making their own decisions at the front lines, uh, just like a good general would in a blitzkrieg. Um, so it all ties together. It's funny how all these threads, you know, just run through the exact same stuff. But I think it gets to that's why I like your show, Jim, is because you're, you're trying to untangle those threads and, and lay them out for everybody to see so that we can recognize the patterns later. Like we're building those mental models to see them later again, right? Exactly. And, and then repetition, repetition. Um, I would add, you know, the other things you want to see in somebody is both persistence and patience, uh, but, but also action on ideas. If you have the greatest idea in the world and you take no action against it, guess what? You, you, you get nothing. Yeah. Worthless. And, and like, I cannot tell you the number of people in quant who've like come to me and said, this model is the greatest model in the world. And like, yeah. And I'm like, okay, okay. Cool, start wow. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And then, you know, I, you know, they'll come back and they'll, you know, I try to help younger people who are helping, you know, on a kind of a pay it forward basis. And, okay. and, you know, the, the idea that, um, that listen, I, I value ideas, as you know, extraordinarily highly, but ideas alone no, I'm sorry. That's masturbatory in my opinion. Yes. What you want is knowledge and action, right? So if you don't marry those two, it simply does not matter how good your ideas are. They're, they'll never make it. Other people won't know about them. Yeah. Um, and, and so the, your network will, you know, be N equals one. <laughs> and, and, that's, you know, it's, we, we use that as a joke, right. About our talking about personal experiences, but the network is, that's the value right there is, is in, in the world we're in now. Are you kidding me? You need to be, you have to, you have to shout from the rooftops, uh, even a great idea because like, there'll be so many people who are either too lazy or have a different point of view or don't think things through. And like, Great. I'm glad uh, because, you know, you want those people to be able to compete against, in my opinion. Yeah. And I think that's like one of the with the as interconnected as the world is today. Now that that ability to plan a flag has never been easier, I think. And to have the find the people that rally around what you believe in, that want to create the same change in the world that you believe in. It's probably never been easier to find them and, and work together, even like, you know, geographically dispersed. Uh, and so, I mean, to me, like to go back to what you're saying, like that it's an incredible opportunity if you have that trust, that, you know, initiative, that, uh, you know, that wanting to like make your take your shot in the world. Like it's never been a better time to be that person with the tools and the the ability to discover networks. Um, and it's incredibly exciting time to be alive, I think. And, you know, there's you can get you can paint lots of negative pictures in macro environments. You look at federal debt levels and expensive markets and, uh, you know, political strife and discord. And it, it'd be really easy to build the bear case of humanity. But that's always been the case. Of right? course. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 you know, uh, just uh, to follow on on that point, I mean, that's one of the central messages of the Great Reshuffle is that time, space and geography is, have collapsed. Mm -hmm. And um, the what the implications of that are are extraordinary uh, because you you no longer um, uh, have to be a, a a person. Let's say you live in Alabama and you have this great idea around you know X Y Z. In the old days, um, and you didn't want to move, uh, it was pretty hard finding your your tribe, so to speak. Yeah. And today, it's never been easier. And, and if you, if you use it the right way, they're going to give you great feedback and you're going to go, I didn't think about that. And the iterative process will go faster and faster, but it'll get better and better and better. I just, I mean, like this world that we're, that we're now in and moving towards, I just think is like, I, I too feel just amazingly lucky to be around at this particular period in time. And people think I'm crazy when I say that, but. It's like, oh, just wait, wait and see. Well, listen, 
this has been so much fun. It, it, it equals my expectation, which uh, I think well, I want you to know that that's like, that's a high one. So <laughs> just kidding. I had very low expectations for it. Good. And I did my job correctly. <laughs> <laughs> no, you set it up exactly right. So I'll give you great points on that. Well, one of the last questions we ask everyone on uh, the show for, uh, for the first time as a guest, and, and so you won't have to answer this the next time you come on the podcast, but uh, we, we are going to give you the ability to be, uh, have the powers of the emperor of the world, but unlike um, almost all historical emperors, you can't <laughs> kill anyone and you can't lock anyone up in a re-education camp. But what you can do is incept them. Mm-hmm. As, as they're going to sleep at night, you're that little earworm um, that is saying two ideas to them that they're going to wake up the next day in line with Lao Tzu's, we did it ourselves. And they're going to think that that's their idea. What two things you're going to get people to to think about or change the behavior of that you think would really, really benefit humanity, society, the world? I think the the first one would be, it, it has to be something around growth mindset and that, that it, and a sense of agency that if I want tomorrow to be better than it is today, I can do that. It's available to me and I, I can figure out how to do it. And I know it's going to take work, but I can do it. And there's no hopelessness. Like I will overcome whatever it is. So that providing that initial kind of activation energy for the, my number two, which would be, and this can come off a little Pollyannish, I know, but like, I really have a fundamental belief that when business is done well, it benefits everyone. It benefits the employees. It benefits the customers. It benefits the owners of that business. And it, everyone, it benefits the regulators and the, and co- the c- communities they do business in. Everybody can win and their suppliers. There's a whole ecosystem that it revolves around a business. And when it's done well with a long-term horizon, with win-win relationships across all of those constituents, that it is a force for good. And that capitalism allows that to happen. And that we, uh, we probably are, I, I kind of have a little bias that actually like we're sort of like there's these angels and demons on our shoulders where one angel is like capitalism done right. I'm not saying like, you know, dump all your chemicals in the river and right, you know, right. that kind of shit like that, that to me is not, or, or chiseling your suppliers or, you know, getting over on your employees. Like, I don't believe that's capitalism done right, but that's on one side. And then on the other side, we have like command and control and, and government. Uh, and on this side is actually technology, like figuring out how to do more with less. And, yeah. and on our other side is, uh, is government and wanting to control all this stuff. And that if we could, those two things are, those angels and demons are battling right now for our souls. And I, I sure would like to see that people to appreciate the, the, the potential that can happen when capitalism is practiced in a good way uh, and what it can do for humanity as a species. Um, and I, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, we can outrun from a technology and business standpoint some of the trappings and problems that I think we get dragged into in our tribalism of, of governments and, and small-minded thinking and the, the, the little bitter, grinchy part of our, of our existence as humans. <laughs> Uh, I, I love both of those. And, you know, again, stealing from the author I uh, told you about, uh, you know, he opens his book by saying, you know, um, if you look at all of the religions, all of the societies, all of the mass movements in human history that have promised you that things would get better that you would have a better life, that your children would be safer, that the quality of your food would be higher. All of them, and he said, and I'm including them all, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, all of the major religions, only one system has developed, has given all of those to people, and that is the free market. And he goes, so are there problems? Yes, there are. And we need to address them and we need to be honest about them. And I think you you mentioned many of them, but this idea that... Um, that the free market is not the singular best system 
for if you want to advance human society. Um, I, I'm certainly open to the idea that some knowledge from the future of which I am unaware is going to come up with a different system uh, that operates even better. And you know what? When that happens, I'll be one of the first people to change my mind and say, that new system is great. We got That's to embrace your that. Jim, changing your mind. <laughs> <laughs> but right now, the best system that I know of in, in helping people out of poverty, in, in helping them live better, more dynamic lives, and, and, and all of the things that we've been talking about are free markets. And then, of course, the, your first two are absolutely required, right? If, if your agency is um, given up or tried, you know, people try to give their agency away. No, no, no. That's your, so they can blame, right? Yeah. And, and so your center of gravity has to be internal. If your center of gravity is external, you're going to be buffeted by, you know, other people's ideas, other people's scripts. There's a great book by Darren uh, Brown, the magician, uh, who uh, wrote a very well-written book called uh, Happy, Why More or Less Everything is Okay. And, and one of the things that he says in the book and underlines is that if you don't have that center of gravity in, the, in yourself, your life is going to be really, really hard. So agency, center of gravity in yourself, the get started, you can make it better. I love all of those. And that Yes, capitalism, free markets are great, but we need to improve them. And I, I mean, you know, people say, well, you're so radical in your disposition. And I'm like, when did it become radical to want free markets, free minds and free speech? This was as fun as I was expecting it to be. So thank you. Thank you.